How about now? Can you hear me? Should be connected to the road. We're going to get it together. Wild, wild, wild. Okay. Can you all hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Now sound. All right. Okay. Um, this is my webcam and not my Canon EOS M50. Um, it looks like OBS and Sonoma don't play nicely together. So uh, that's something I learned after updating my, uh, my operating system yesterday uh, so that I wouldn't have any problems live streaming. So uh, here we are. Um, I'm, I'm mostly going to be sharing some stuff on the screen anyway, so it's not a big problem. But uh, welcome everybody. Um, Shalom Aleichem, Rochim Habaim, Heint, Mergen, Redden, Vegan Yiddish. So today we're going to talk about Yiddish. Um, I, uh, I see somebody saying, wow, a real live stream. Yeah, it's a real live stream and it's got all the live problems. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk about Yiddish today, uh, and there's, there's a lot to discuss, but I have a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. One was just the language itself. And the other is, um, a little bit about how it's being discussed, uh, especially lately, especially on social media and in the news media. So it's kind of a, an interesting time for Yiddish. That's why I had this, uh, Thumbnail asking about a Yiddish revival. There's discussion of Yiddish revival. Every, uh, uh, I see in, in the chat as well, uh, good yontif, so uh, same to you. Um, Chag So, uh, yeah, there's, there's kind of a lot to discuss here. For those of you who are um, unfamiliar, what is it giving me a warning about the current bit rate? I am hardwired in. This is just, this is that catastrophic... Uh, <laughs> first live stream that I thought I had uh, navigated. This is my second live stream, and it's the one that's that's going a little weird. Uh, I might I might redo this one later if uh, uh, if we go a little a little rough. So um, I see uh, I, I do have a few concurrent viewers, and everything's nice. So I'm not going to abandon you all. We're going to have a little a nice conversation today. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Yiddish is a uh, Jewish language. What that means is it is a language that has largely been spoken uh, primarily, uh, historically almost exclusively, by communities of Jews um, and not so much by others. Um, Jade, I see you in the chat. Hey! <laughs> so, um, it's influenced heavily by Jewish culture, not just Jewish religion, but also uh, uh, the culture of Jews living the diaspora. It is a Germanic language, uh, unlike Hebrew, which is a Semitic language. Um, and there's kind of a, an interesting history there, so I won't go through the entirety of the history, at least not in this live stream, but uh, it is something that was um, uh, came into existence in starting in about the 11th uh, century, if I remember correctly, maybe the 12th century. Um, I always get the 1100s versus 11th century confused, but it's it is um, about a thousand years after uh, Jews were um, not completely, but mostly expelled from uh, Judea and Samaria, which is where Israel is now. Um, so there's a, a, a beautiful uh, bas relief of. Um, Roman soldiers carrying away loot from the the temple, uh, from the Temple Mount, including the menorah um, that you can see in Rome now. Uh, it's the the arch of uh, Titus, um, but uh, that like Yiddish did not exist when that when that happened. That was something where um, Hebrew was slowly on its way out as the the everyday language of um, Jewish people living in Israel. Um, uh, it had been largely replaced by Aramaic, which is sort of a lingua franca in the region and a very, very closely related language to Hebrew. And it wasn't until about a thousand years later that Yiddish begins to develop and then had about a thousand year history up until the present. So um, it's kind of an interesting language. It is a Germanic language. What happened is, uh, you know, Jews in exile... Uh, moved different places, and uh, they started in part in the Roman Empire, um, and then continued uh, to kind of move from 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 one place to the next um, uh, in in Europe in particular. And so, the interesting thing that that uh, a lot of people don't 
think much about is Yiddish is a Germanic language, but it has Romance language words in it because a lot of the Jews before Yiddish existed spoke what is sometimes referred to as Judeo-Romance, which is like vulgar Latin, but with um, sort of Hebrew and Aramaic and other sort of Jewish influences. So Yiddish comes into being around, um, you know, the, the turn of the millennium. It's something that... Uh, it is a Germanic language. This is people, it's just like how, you know, Jews now speak uh, English in the United States, where it's like, it's the language of the people around you, it's the language everybody speaks. However, uh, there was a, a long history of um, very, very serious segregation in, in Europe. Um, and so Jews were living in different communities, not just out of, you know, desire to, to live, you know, near one another and have a, a minion when you go to shul and all this stuff, but also because they were um, barred from, from living with um, uh, non-Jews and living in the same towns and, you know, working in the same trade guilds, working the same jobs and so on. Um, I see in the chat, would this Judeo romance be related to Ladino? And the answer is sort of, and I'll talk a little bit about Ladino in a, in a moment because it's also very interesting, um, but it's not the same thing, but it's, it, it is sort of related. Um, so, uh, what happens is you have, uh, people who, who move to sort of Germanic lands. It wasn't Germany at that time. Um, so you have these, you know, places like Bavaria and so on and, um, acquire a language that's a Germanic language that is not what we think of as like standard high German. Um, it's related to middle high German and is in fact a descendant of middle high German. Um, but about 30% of it is Hebrew and Aramaic, and there's cultural reasons for that. There are literary reasons. There are religious reasons. Um, I see in the in the chat ghettoized, possibly, and the answer is yes, but also the ghetto had not yet been invented at that point. Um, that was something that uh, happened in Venice in the, I want to say 1415, maybe as late as the 1600s, probably a little bit earlier than that. Um, we can look those dates up uh, online, but it's, it's, it, it, Yiddish predates the ghetto, um, but not segregation. So you have this language, and it is a Germanic language, and it's very, very close to German, but it's also very different. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, like, when I say it's a Germanic language, it's got phrasal verbs, all of the basic words. Uh, if you do, if anybody here has heard of a Swadesh test, it's one of the ways that you can determine whether languages are related. And uh, it's looking at basic words, words for like family members, kinship terms, words for weather phenomena, and so on. It's really clearly a Germanic language, right? You have uh, words for like brother. English is a Germanic language, by the way, uh, in case anybody was confused about that. Some people sometimes think that English is a Romance language because of the heavy influence of French after the Norman Conquest in 1066. Um, English is a Germanic language. And that's why you see words like brother in English and, uh, you know... Uh, uh, I guess it's brother in, in, in uh, German, in Yiddish, uh, Bruder or Brider, uh, or Brider, depending on the accent. Um, so they're, you know, it's, it's very much a Germanic language. Um, the influence of Hebrew and Aramaic, though, comes in part from uh, Jewish culture, in part from Jewish religion. It's hard to separate the two because it is an ethno-religion. Uh, meaning that there's a, an ethnic group that has culture, language, food, ways, uh, observances, and so on, and the religious practices are, are tied into that. It's not a sort of universalizing um, uh, religion that uh, can be thought of as a, as a separate module from the rest of your life. So I see um, the Netherlands checking in with Britter. Um, I see also in the chat, Meshuga is a Dutch slang word, and I love the Dutch spelling of it. Uh, came to Amsterdam through Yiddish. Yes. Um, so... There's this kind of interesting thing where you have a Germanic language where it's many things, like many sentences, could be word for word the same with German, with an accent, but it's the same kind of accent as you might hear in a um, sort of non-standard German uh, dialect. So, um, you know, many, many, many things are the same. And like I said, body parts, and like hand uh, is the same. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are very, very clearly closely related to German. You have phrasal verbs, you have um, verb second patterns in, uh, in, in the main clause. It's just very clearly a Germanic language. But you have all these words, and these words are really interesting. So for instance, the word for today. If anybody's studying Yiddish on Duolingo, I should probably address the accents, um, and I'll address that in just a moment, but know that there are different accents. Duolingo has kind of a, a modern Hasidic accent that's had some sound changes that happen over time. Um, so in, in what's 
sometimes referred to, I think, contentiously as standard Yiddish. There is uh, like Weinreich Yivo Yiddish, the, the Yiddish uh, Institute Yiddish. Uh, it would be pronounced Heint uh, in uh, Hasidic Yiddish. I think it might be Hant. Um, that's the word for, for today. That's not the word for today in modern German. The word for today in modern German is Heute. Um, and apologies to Germans for my, for my pronunciation there. Um, the word in Yiddish for today is actually the word that in Middle High German meant tonight. And for anybody who's you know, observing Hanukkah this evening, you, you would already know that in Jewish culture, the day starts at sundown. Uh, it does not start at midnight, which is sort of a, a very modern construct. It's not something that's easily observable. Um, and it doesn't start at sunrise because, you know, the moment that you know that the, the sun has risen, you've already missed it. So um, the word for today, like the basic, basic word in this language is a Germanic word, but it's a Germanic word that's obsolete in other German languages or Germanic languages. And it's a, la a word that, that uh, is related to um, a sort of cultural, uh, like a Jewish cultural um, aspect of, of Jewish life. Now, this is the kind of thing that also develops when you have communities living for a thousand years, uh, more or less segregated from their, from their surrounding communities. You also get Slavic uh, influences on Yiddish, and this is really interesting because what happened is uh, Jews kind of moved eastward uh, as time went on. So they, there's all sorts of arguments about you know, the exact path uh, in the diaspora that I really don't want to wade into because there's, it's very, very contentious. But the general idea is we know it's Germanic language, we know it's related to other sort of Germanic things spoken, you know, around uh, where Germany is now, and we know that people moved eastward. And so you get this kind of situation with Yiddish, where people are speaking a Germanic language, but they're speaking it in what's now Poland, in what's now uh, Russia, what was the Pale of Settlement, uh, where everyone around in the, in the non-Jewish towns around them speak Slavic languages. And so you get this kind of interesting influence from Slavic languages as well. Um, I see in the chat, uh, Heute is today in German, and uh, Haudich is today in Dutch, is that correct? Uh, you can correct my, my pronunciation there. Uh, Haudich, maybe? Uh, some of the Dutch vowels I, I find fun, but I, <laughs> I also find a challenge. So uh, what you have is a Germanic language that has a lot of interesting influences. And the influences are, are like, not just, like I said, you know, the word for today being an old Germanic word for tonight, but also you have a lot from Hebrew. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the last day of the week is Shabbos, uh, which is Shabbat in Hebrew. It's not, uh, you know, Saturday or any uh, equivalent thereof, and it starts on Friday night. So it's a very much a cultural uh, influence that, that affects the language and language use. And if you're doing Duolingo uh, Yiddish, you'll see this a lot. You'll see a lot of words that are like very, very clearly Germanic. And then you're going to see things like, you know, I made a chala, you know, a chala gemacht lekuvid Shabbos. Well, lekuvid is borrowed straight out of Hebrew. Lekavod, but there's a, a, a shift in the um, stress pattern, and there's a shift in the accent. And Shabbos is the same thing. Uh, what's a, a tav or a ta sound in modern Hebrew is a sa sound in uh, Yiddish. At the end of words and unstressed syllables, there's there's rules around this stuff, but it's it's a very very common historical process. Um, and so it's kind of. Uh, uh, interesting because you have sentences where some of them are exactly the same as as any sort of non-standard German dialect and some of them are completely impenetrable to German speakers even those who are very familiar with a variety of dialects uh, and so it's it's this kind of very interesting language now what happened is you also have like I said Slavic uh, uh, influences so you get words like um, if anybody's had uh, Ruglich those are, uh, it's from a, I think it's a Polish word that, that's related. It's like a croissant-shaped um, treat. Uh, Rugel is from the, it's from a, a Slavic word. And then you have this system of diminutives in Yiddish. It's very similar to the system of diminutives in Dutch. So you have a first diminutive, ul, and you have a second diminutive, ulla. Uh, and this can be both derisive. So if you call somebody, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to, call people derisive things but you can you can say something where you have a diminutive and you can be um calling somebody you know like a little man like a a, a manager in dutch right um or uh it can be something that's a, a term of endearment now i saw um 
Uh, in the chat, uh, Rogal, Rogalik. Yeah, uh, I, and I'm certain I'm pronouncing this wrong because I have not studied any Polish, so apologies there. Um, so I, I saw in the chat people, you know, talking to one another, does anybody speak in a Yiddish? And I see words like chutzpah, schmutz, putz. And um, I think that's actually a really great place to start. One, because it'll let me kind of go into language ideologies about what we actually know of Yiddish. People sometimes know bagel and babka and, you know, cholent and so on. Um, but also, uh, this is a perfect list of words that I think categorizes Yiddish really well. Chutzpah is from Hebrew. Um, schmuck is Germanic. Putz is from, uh, like, Romanian or, or what, you know, became Romanian. Uh, so you have this, this um, uh, whole kind of mix of words here. And they mean different things. Like chutzpah in Hebrew does not mean something that you would actually want to characterize yourself as in, uh, in Hebrew. And even in Yiddish, it really doesn't. In Yiddish English, which is the English spoken by... Um, some descendants of Ashkenazi Jews who, you know, have borrowed words from Yiddish into English. It is not Yiddish, it is Yiddish English. In Yiddish English, chutzpah is a positive thing. And this is something that kind of happens a lot. So you see words that are related. Um, schwitzing has a slightly different meaning in English than sweating does, but uh, schwitzen in Yiddish is literally just to sweat. Um, so there's kind of a, a really, I, I find this whole, like, system fascinating. Um, I see in the chat, is that the Rutledge colloquial Yiddish in the back? How is it? It's pretty good. I like it a lot. I've, I've, I've put a bunch of little books in the back here. I have uh, Weinreich College Yiddish as well. Um, and I should just clarify here, I'm not a native Yiddish speaker. Um, I, I lived in Germany for a while as a child and, and had a lot of like input in German in my childhood. Uh, I've studied Dutch. Like I, I'm, I, I'm a dabbler in Germanic languages, and I am an enthusiast with Yiddish, and I'm kind of agnostic about which variety uh, I, I like, which is something that sets me very apart from a lot of other people. A lot of people have very strong feelings about it. We're going to talk about those in like just a moment. Um, I see my wife's family is historically German and Yiddish, and they say oy vey. Oy vey is oh woe in uh, English. It's, it's exactly the same as, oh, woe is me, oy vey is mir. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's a cognates and there's borrowing of things that we already have, and it has sort of, sort of a different function in English, which I find really, uh, always find really interesting. So, uh, you have these words. Um, I, I think I gave the example of, like, you know, a chub, uh, a chala, a chub gemacht, a chala, Lekuvit Shabbos, where that may not be clear to a, a speaker of other Germanic languages because of all of the Hebrew influence. You also have words like, you know, nafkamina, which is from Aramaic, and it means the practical difference. That is something that comes from learning Gemara, which is a, a way of studying Jewish law that's um, part of the, the, the Talmud. And I should be clear for anybody who's unfamiliar with the Talmud here, you, you hear all sorts of things said about the Talmud, like the Talmud says this, the Talmud says that. It is not necessarily scripture in the same sense that um, other religions may have scripture. It is more like a record of, um, of legal arguments. So it's like reading the Supreme Court arguments, and, and they include minority opinions. They include, in this case, they include stories and anecdotes and everything else. So next time somebody says, oh, the Talmud says this, I guarantee you it also says the opposite. And it also says, you know, a third thing that's completely unrelated to the first two. Um, so just be aware of that. That's where you get this, like, nafkamina, like, what's the practical difference between these two opinions? And you hear these kind of things just peppered in everyday Yiddish. Now, uh, Yiddish, uh, I see in the chat, do you speak Hebrew? I'm working on it. Um, I, I speak better modern Hebrew than biblical, and uh, both are kind of okay. Um, so, uh, I see uh, in the Netherlands, chutzpah is courage, and it took me a moment because the G, I, I, I was thrown off. I love it. Um, yeah. So these words get borrowed, and they mean different things as they're borrowed, and this is really, really common. You see this all the time. You also see things where, like, across languages, we borrow singulars as plural and plurals as singular. So I can go to the bodega here and order a panini, but in Italy, like, that makes no sense because panini is the plural of sandwich, whereas here it's a single sandwich and it's grilled. Um, you see that with chutzpah across languages. You see that with all sorts of words um, from, from Yiddish origin. Um, I see in the chat case law and precedents and bad decisions by that French court. Exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, they include, there, there are opinions that are included in the Talmud by somebody who's referred to as the other one. Um, so, like, you know, we should be aware of, of you know, not, not taking everything that we hear as, uh, as, um, as uh, you know, law. So uh, Yiddish develops 
uh, people are, are kind of spread across Europe. In Western Europe, there's what's called the Haskalah, which is actually, it's a, a, a loan from Hebrew. It's basically an equivalent to like enlightenment. And one of the things that happened is you have this movement away from Yiddish. This is people speaking a Germanic language, but they're in like German kind of places, Prussia, Germany, like so on. And they said, you know, we're going to be enlightened modern citizens of modern states. This is post-Napoleon, like post-emancipation. If you don't know what the emancipation is, you should look it up. But basically, like once Napoleon conquered lands, he said, okay, now Jews are full citizens too. And it was a very controversial move. Some places, you know, undid it once, uh, once Napoleon was gone. There's a whole thing. There's a whole history there. But in the West, basically, Yiddish um, kind of... Uh, went away. It's, it, it stopped being spoken as widely. In the East, um, it, that was not the case. And um, that continued until about 1939. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the um, discussions that are happening around Yiddish now, but I want to point out that a lot of them pit, like sort of pit Hebrew against Yiddish because of modern political uh, positions. People will say, like, you know, I like Yiddish because I'm anti-Zionist, or I like Hebrew because I'm Zionist, or I like Hebrew because I'm, you know, not politically Zionist, but I, I don't know. There's all sorts of things that people do, and they try to bring these languages in. So one thing that I want to say is, um, just regarding the number of speakers of Yiddish, we hear that it's an endangered language a lot. I see in the chat who speaks Yiddish today. I'm going to answer that right now. So we hear that it's an endangered language a lot, but Lots of people speak it, and in fact, the number of people who speak it is growing, and it's growing quite rapidly. But then you hear nobody speaks it, and people are reviving it. Non-native speakers are reviving Yiddish. There are tons of native speakers. The native speaker communities are growing. They're not shrinking. They're not going anywhere. They're growing. But some of them are somewhat insular. Some of them are not insular, but the people who are reviving Yiddish maybe don't like them. Um, because they disagree about religion or politics or whatever else. And so it's really interesting. If you Google how many speakers of Yiddish are there, I was like, oh, let, me, let me actually just uh, make sure I have my facts right here. When you Google it, I remembered, this is why I couldn't figure out, I couldn't remember what the number was. You get a bunch of different answers when you Google it. So uh, you see, like when you Google this, first thing comes up, today Yiddish is spoken primarily in three regions, the United States, Israel, and various pockets of Europe which is very broad, uh, and it says under 1 million people speak it. Then you see there are over 150,000 speakers. Uh, then you see about a quarter of a million. Then you see from Wikipedia 600,000. So it is all over the place, anywhere between um, 150,000 to a million speakers, depending on who you ask and, I guess, time of day and whatever else. Um, so most of the native speakers of Yiddish right now are Haredi, which is, um, uh, or, or Chassidim, which is a, a way of saying um, very, very, um, I don't want to say very religious Jews, because there's plenty of Jews who are very religious who are not religious in that way. Um, but there's they're the, the people that would be your stereotype when you think about what is a stereotype of somebody who is Jewish and who speaks Yiddish. So you may expect like black hat, payas, beard, black coat, um, you know, so on and so on and so on. That's, it's the, the religious communities, but it's a particular type of religious community, um, usually that are organized around uh, dynasties of charismatic teachers uh, that are the ones who continue to speak Yiddish. So in New York, there's a ton of Yiddish speakers. Um, in Brooklyn, a lot are members of the Satmar community. Um, my, the friends of mine who, who are native speakers of Yiddish are Satmar. Um, and it's, that's mostly who speaks it. Um, the, the, uh, sort of conservative, reform, reconstructionist, non-practicing, secular, you know, have Jewish ancestry, but don't identify as Jewish. Those are folks who generally are not native speakers of Yiddish, um, but maybe learning Yiddish as a foreign language. And there's a very interesting kind of thing that happens here because before World War II, you're, um, uh, I get Uriel and Max Weinreich messed up in my head because they're both very influential. Um, Uriel Weinreich, here we go, uh, with the <laughs> Yiddish uh, Institute, basically was making an argument for Yiddish as like a, a um, national language. Um, and this is, you got to think about the time and place. This was saying like Yiddish is not broken, Yiddish is not jargon, Yiddish is not slang, Yiddish is not bad German. It is a national language, just like High German is the national language of Germany, and like other Germans might speak different kinds of German, but there's a, an official national language, or like French as the national language of France. Like this was very much 
like trying to create something like the Academy Francaise or, you know, the Spanish Academy or, you know, any of these kind of like language academies that say this is a national language, this is a people, this is a respectable language, we have rules, these are the rules, and so on. And Weinreich didn't really succeed in that, but there is the Yiddish Institute and there are de facto standards, but they're standards that are claimed by an institute that now basically represents non-speakers of Yiddish, um, non-native speakers of Yiddish, I should say. There's a handful, I don't want to say that everybody who's associated with Yiddish is not a native speaker, because that's obviously not true at all, but there's a handful of speakers and a lot of people who interact with Yivo learn Yiddish as a second language and they learn what they believe to be like the formal or correct rules about Yiddish. Now, Weinreich made a, a compromise. Duolingo makes a totally different compromise. Um, Yivo takes sort of one region's grammar and one region's accent and smushes them together. And it's kind of like literary Yiddish and writing and theatrical Yiddish pre-war uh, in, in speech. And that is one kind of accent. That accent is very different from the Hasidic accent that is the accent used by, or, you know, spoken by the um, descendants of people who survived the Holocaust. And you can't really talk about Yiddish and avoid the Holocaust because six million Jews in, you know, mostly in Europe were murdered. And so what you have is this dramatic shift in the language, of course, because most of the speakers were killed. And uh, this is kind of erased in some of the some of the discussions of Yiddish. A lot of times people say like, oh, you know, Jews just started speaking Hebrew after 1948 and like Hebrew just sort of crowded Yiddish out. It's like, well, no, not, not exactly. Um, and just on that point, very briefly, uh, one of the reasons for Hebrew as a lingua franca in Israel is that it is the, the I mentioned, it's the language that's spoken before Yiddish even existed. It was the language of the Jews for, you know, going back for, for thousands of years. Um, it was spoken continuously in different communities. Maybe not your everyday life. You might not go to the market and buy bread in Hebrew um, in, you know, 1100 in, I don't know, France. But it was still spoken by most people, especially any anyone who's literate, which was actually most people um, at that most Jews at that time, um, and so it was something that was that was that could have worked as a lingua franca. The accent now is in some ways like deferring to what was an Algerian accent, and this is I think a clue to why modern Hebrew um, is is the language of Israel and not Yiddish, as some people you know think that it should be. Uh, the reason is that there were eight hundred and fifty thousand Jews who lived in the Middle East and North Africa, and who, um, you know, before World War II and subsequent to World War II were basically ethnically cleansed from where they lived. They did not speak Yiddish. They spoke uh, Ladino. They spoke Judeo-Arabic. They spoke, I mean, they spoke all different things, uh, Judeo-Persian. But what they all had in common was a familiarity with Hebrew. And so, Making Yiddish the, the, the default language in Israel just doesn't really make any sense. And to say that, you know, it's, it's that people quit speaking Yiddish and switch to Hebrew. Well, most of the people who speak Hebrew are the descendants of people who spoke Judeo-Arabic and Judeo-Persian and Ladino and all these other languages. I was asked about Ladino. I promised I'd get to that. So this is an interesting thing. Ladino is um, related to, like, middle... Uh, Spanish. It's it's I don't middle maybe is not the right word here, but it's Spanish as spoken in the Iberian Peninsula before 1392, and um, it's kind of interesting because there was less segregation in the same way that there was in like the the Eastern Europe. Um, it was different. Maybe is better than saying less. And uh, when the Spanish Inquisition uh, took place, insert no one expects the Spanish Inquisition joke here. Uh, most of the Jews were expelled or fled. And, you know, those who, who went to Portugal, they made a bad decision and, and subsequently also uh, ended up uh, leaving. So I think it's between 1392 and 1492. Um, you have this massive movement to uh, what is now Turkey. It was the Ottoman Empire um, at the time. So you have Turkey, Greece, and it's this really interesting thing where for about 500 years, you have what is effectively a variety of Spanish developing on its own in Turkey. So it's like, it's just, it's fascinating. They keep some, some archaicisms from uh, older varieties of Spanish. And of course, Ladino has developed on its own, much like Yiddish developed on its own um, as a Germanic language in sort of Slavic speaking lands. Ladino developed more on its own as a uh, Romance language in Turkic lands. Um, so very, very uh, interesting 
history there. Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit. I'll, I'll answer some some questions here, but I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the uh, sort of discussion of Yiddish now. And I only have uh, about twenty minutes left because. Uh, the sun's going down quickly here. Um, so I see, sorry, is this institute in Europe, diaspora, where is this uh, formalization effort centered? It, it was sort of um, uh, Europe and the U.S. Now it's primarily, it's the U.S. Um, there is a French uh, sort of Yiddish center in Paris, and they weird me out because the, <laughs> I, I love them. I love French. I, I love French people. Like, But it's very weird to me because the lax vowels that I'm used to, because French doesn't have those lax vowels, they, they become not lax. And so, like, uh, you know, I'm used to hearing something like, um, I, 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 I'm trying to think of, like, a good example. Like, like putts might be, like, putts, um, where the vowel is slightly different. Um, I see, guess where a lot of Jews from Spain went? Mexico. Yeah, also, there's Argentina. There's, there's all sorts of history there. Um, so, uh, let me pull up some of these uh, articles that I was interested in uh, talking about. And um, uh, then I will uh, share my screen, and I'll talk about them a little bit. I see Happy Hanukkah from, from Philadelphia, uh, right back at you. Um, let's see. Uh, where is my... You have to bear with me for a moment. It's been a technologically challenging day for me. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I know I can open a couple of these. Yiddish is making a comeback, pandemic and apps are fueling, so I'm going to open these. And uh, I also had one more. So I, I was asked to put something on my blog uh, as sponsored content, and I got angry at them, and I did not do it. This is, this is from Babbel, um, and I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like it one bit. So um, uh, it's actually not that bad, but I, I, I want to talk about it, um, which is kind of like putting it on my blog, but also uh, a little different. Um, so if I can find it, I'm not sure if I can, uh, then I will share that. And uh, let's see, recents, <sighs> unique, there we go. There we go, I'm gonna share a window uh, so you can see this. Uh, unique languages of Europe, the mysteries of Yiddish. Um, I'm gonna make that Full screen. I'm gonna first make my <laughs> my um, studio visible to me, and then I will get going. Okay. You should actually see. Yeah, you should see this. Um, let me see if I can add myself to, uh, to this display, since this is not my previous display. Um, let me just add my little video capture device and, uh, and uh, talk to you all while I'm, while I'm doing this. Um, so you should be able to see me on the screen in three, two, one, go. Maybe even had a cool little crossfade there. Um, okay, so let me just make sure that I can see all of you on my, there we go. All right. So, uh, they wanted me to share this. I want to talk about it. Uh, this is, uh, Unique Languages of Europe, the, mis the Mysteries of Yiddish. Um, so they say Yiddish isn't a dialect or a jargon. True, correct. It is a language all to itself. Uh, tormented by the past. Very dramatic language here. Forgotten by the present. Very dramatic, and that's kind of a bold statement there. Uh, Yiddish is a language in danger of disappearing. Sort of, not really. I mean, the, the number of native speakers are growing. Um, it was in danger of disappearing when everybody was, um, you know, being killed. Um, so <laughs> that, that'll do. You know, that'll, that'll do it. All right, so they say, let's see what makes it so unique. Uh... You say Latin is a dead language, English is a living language, but other languages are a bit more difficult to categorize. Yiddish is not. It's a living language. Not so difficult. Uh, how can we categorize Yiddish? Living language. That's my answer to that. Um, and who speaks Yiddish? Is it a, quote, surviving language? Uh, known as, and I'm not going to attempt Polish, uh, Zhidovsky in Czech and Yiddish Sprach in Austria, literally Jewish language. By the way, Yiddish is, the full name is Yiddish Teich, which is Yiddish Dutch, Yiddish German. Um, 
language of Ashkenazi Jews from Central and Eastern Europe starting in the Middle Ages. Accurate. So uh, as an Indo-European language in the Germanic family, that's a tricky thing to say. Um, I'm not sure about this because, um, yes, it's a Germanic language, but it's also a contact language. So I don't know how much I would want to put it like in the Indo-European family instead of saying it's its own thing. Um, so, uh, it says originated in the 13th century. That's, that's a late thing. That's, I think, following, um, I don't, I don't want to wade into this. I, I, I know there's different arguments based on like Katz has one argument and Weinreich has another and like, it's so, but it's 13th century is a late um, assessment. Uh, we know it can't be later than that because of sound changes that happened in, in other Germanic languages. So this is like a historical linguistics thing. You can say like it can't be later than this because these sound changes happen in this language that it's, you know, related to. Uh, so, uh, modern cities of Cologne, Trier, and Mainz, various Germanic dialects, their German dialects influence how it's spoken, yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm going to get to some other stuff here. So, they talk about Naya Yiddish with a, um, with a uh, not an umlaut, a diuresis. Very interesting. And say, who speaks Yiddish? Up until 1945, Yiddish had 11 million speakers. Really, I would say... By ninety by by the nineteen by nineteen thirty nine ish, there were about eleven million. But it's we're just act like it was static in this way, um, with more than one third in the Soviet Union alone. That's the pale of settlement. Uh, Seventy five years after the Churban or uh, destruction, the Yiddish word for the Holocaust, it's estimated there are between one and two million speakers. This is a higher estimate. Uh, with thirty thousand in the UK and one hundred seventy five thousand in the US and Canada, this is all you know mostly fine. Um, they talk about Kiryas Yoel for some reason. Um, they say Yiddish or Yiddishes. There are multiple Yiddishes. This is accurate, just like any language variety. Then there's a whole thing on Yiddish in the Soviet Union, which I thought was weird. Um, just a, an interesting. Thing here. They say 3.5 million Russians spoke Yiddish until 1945. In the 1920s, dozens of newspapers and thousands of books in Yiddish were published in the Soviet Union. At the same time, the language is recognized as one of the four official languages, the Belarusian Soviet Republic, alongside Russian and yada, yada, yada. Uh, Stalin decided to create the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, the goal of this territory. This is a weird thing to, to include in like a story of Yiddish. So um, the Soviet Union tried to like de-Judaize Yiddish. They added um, vowels. They respelled all the words that were loaned from Hebrew. So like Hebrew, um, if you say like Shabbos, it's spelled like it is in Hebrew without the vowels. They added vowels to that, and then um, killed most of the Yiddish speakers in a purge. Um, so I know uh, you know uh, Dara Horn talks a lot about the the. Um, I think it's the Night of the Poets. Uh, but there's just, like, it's a very weird thing to include here because this sounds like, you know, there's a great place with a great community and it's, you know, less populated, but boy, was the Soviet Union good for the Jews. And it was very much not. Um, that's where we get the word refusenik in, in English. Uh, so it's kind of a, 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 just a strange thing to include here. This is part of why I didn't want to include this on my blog, like, as a sponsored post because it's like, this is very, this is a little, a little tanky. I don't know. Um, so, uh, just kind of an interesting thing. They say, although it's, you know, it's still possible to learn to speak Yiddish in some schools in the region and the language still enjoys official status, very strange continuity between Soviet Union and Russian Republic here that, that is worrisome. Um, they say, uh, you know, they talk about Birobijan, which is it just, this is a very weird thing. Uh, so then they talk about the Hebrew Renaissance, and they did mention the Holocaust before, but then they say the creation of Israel as a state brought with it a modernization of Hebrew. Inevitably, this led to a slow decline of Yiddish. No, inevitably it did not. First of all, Yiddish is, again, as we established, growing. And second of all, this was not inevitable. And third of all, like, does, does some, you know, does some guy coming from Baghdad or coming from Tehran or coming from, you know, uh, uh, Fez or Morocco, like anywhere in Morocco, like... Does that guy speaking modern Hebrew really, like, inevitably lead to the decline of, of Yiddish? No, of course not. So what, what led to the decline of Yiddish was, you know, murdering most of the speakers. Um, kind of a big deal. There's also, obviously, assimilationist forces in the United States, and the United States has been, you know, historically a very good place. Uh, so, and plus, English is very closely related. So if it's, you know, speak English or you'll be, you know, ostracized for it. And also it's really easy to speak English if you speak Yiddish, like to learn uh, English if you speak Yiddish, then you can see that having, having an effect. Um, yada, yada, yada. 
uh, is Yiddish similar to Hebrew? For someone unfamiliar with both languages, they can sound somewhat similar. I don't think they sound alike at all. Um, I used to not be able to identify Hebrew at all when I heard it spoken modern Hebrew. I just, it was like Russian being spoken in Portuguese, but I couldn't parse any of the words. Um, now, much, much better. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, Yiddish is very much a Germanic language. And they say, what's the, the, the legacy of Yiddish today? And they talk a little bit about literature. They talk about um, non-religious Jews uh, expressing an interest in this lost culture, uh, the generation that didn't know the Holocaust directly, and while the last survivors gradually disappear, it's about understanding how the Jewish community lived and communicated before the war. I get that. There's a, an element of nostalgia, uh, even nostalgia for a place that the people who lived there were like, this was terrible. Like, I want nothing to do with that place. But I get that. Like, later on, you feel about, you know, there's, there's a, a you, you watch Fiddler on the Roof and you think, like, you know, there's something beautiful there. I'd love to go experience that. And maybe you can experience it by reading Shalom Aleichem or uh, Shalom Aleichem in uh, Yivo, uh, standard Yiddish. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fluff piece that I thought was... Um, just a little, had a little weirdness to it. And I want to kind of lean into that weirdness a bit. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to share a lot of stuff on my screen that I don't need, intend to. Let's do this. I'm going to share um, a couple of Washington Post articles and then I'm going to go. Uh, so the pandemic and apps are fueling a surge of interest in Yiddish. Uh, and of course they start with oi, schlep, spiel, schmuck, shtick, and glitch, um, which are, you know, I, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting place to, to, to start. Right? They want to give a hook with like what people actually are familiar with. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, they say Yiddish words have long made their way into English, but the language spoken by Ashkenazi Jews across Europe for a thousand years was considered to be a dying language for decades after the Holocaust. This, they, they at least, you know, say it directly. Um, and they say the language was passed down, was not passed down outside Hasidic and other strictly Orthodox Jewish communities in the yeshivas. Strict is the word that's like kind of an interesting thing here. They, they, they within, uh, within, in Yiddish it might be called, uh, uh, machmir, um, which is borrowed from, from Hebrew, um, meaning like religiously strict, uh, in terms of, uh, how you approach observance and how you approach, you know, lifestyle. Um. And yada, 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 yada. But there's an interesting thing here where people are talking about Duolingo. Uh, and that's that's what I wanted to get to by the end of this. So in the past two years, there's been a surge of new Yiddish learners. During the pandemic, more than 300,000 people registered to learn Yiddish on Duolingo. Now, that just means they created an account. We have no idea if they're actually studying, but, you know, maybe they are. Um, I've seen a handful of, you know, so-and-so shocks Yiddish speakers. Like, you won't believe this guy speaks Yiddish, shocks the native speakers. And he went and spoke to a bunch of Hebrew speakers at 770. But that's, you know, he didn't know they were Israelis. He just knew that they were black hat. Um, it's a kind of a <laughs> weird thing. Uh, maybe I should talk about that video some other time. Uh, so during the pandemic, more than 300,000 people registered to learn Yiddish on Duolingo. Uh, same with Rutgers University uh, uh, saying that that's about half the total number of Yiddish speakers in the world today, which is a very interesting thing. So what happens when, you know, non-native speakers outnumber the native speakers and, and have, you know, thoughts on that? Um, and uh, let's see. Um, under 30, five, Yivo had a, a huge increase. So people wanted to learn Yiddish during the pandemic. They said there's a deep and, and profound hunger for knowledge of this history, culture, and language. Um, what we're seeing is not simply nostalgia for a lost world, but a repossession of it. Um, not sure that, uh, that, that repossession is, is, um, I don't know, it sounds kind of like a dibbuk, which is a, a Yiddish word for a possession. Uh, maybe not the right idea here. But, uh, uh, you know, holding on to the identity. There's a really interesting thing here where they're talking about, like, studying Yiddish as part of a trend. And the trend is, um, you know, reconnecting with roots, but not wanting to connect with the people who actually speak it right now. It's this sort of idealized roots. And so um, it's a very interesting thing. Like, I want to read, uh, you know, Shalom Aleichem. I want to read literature. But you get into this argument of like, well, those people don't speak it right because they have loan words from English, right? Instead of saying like, you know, vermacht Fenster, uh, I guess it's der Fenster. I don't know, in, 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 in standard Yiddish. Uh, they might say, you know, vermacht de Wende, like close the window. Um, so the fact that it a, is a living language is in some ways off-putting to a number of the, the language learners that I've 
you know, heard from or spoken to or seen talking about this online, uh, which is just a really fascinating um, uh, sort of social aspect here of the study of, of Yiddish. So I'm going to go back to just me here. Um, there's, I thought I was going to go back to just me. Let's do this again. There we go. There's, um, there's just some really, really interesting uh, discussions of Yiddish where there's this idea of like it's a dying language or it's a dead language and it's up to non-native speakers to use an artificial version of it to, you know, restore this language and, and carry on its memory. But in the meantime, there's like, depending on who you ask, 600,000 native speakers who are, you know, just uh, singing lullabies, going to the market, like doing, doing what, just living their lives in Yiddish. And so we have to kind of erase that group of people to then have this fantasy about standard Yiddish. Now, I'm not going to make an argument about like how you want to pronounce it, anything like that's all fine to me. Like if you want to speak like Hasidic Yiddish, and I mentioned Duolingo making a, a um, compromise. The compromise that they made is that they teach the standard standard Yiddish grammar. So you see D, der, dos, you see all the declensions of, of uh, you know, nouns and all the conjugations and all this stuff. But then you actually have it spoken by native speakers who don't use that in their everyday speech because the dative is basically on its way out in, in Hasidic Yiddish. There's tons of, of um, research papers on this where you know the, the case system in modern Hasidic Yiddish is changing slowly, um, probably from contact with English, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it could be a variety of different things, and different scholars are attempting to, to tease that apart. But it's really this kind of interesting thing where the way that it's spoken by native speakers is like, well, no, we don't want that. So for me, I, I love it. Um, and, and Duolingo has kind of interrupted this, where you now have, well, these are native speakers. So you're going to learn you know, literary grammar that nobody says, but you're going to hear it spoken by native speakers how they actually sound. So when you're going to hear, instead of like cholent, which is a, a Romance language word, right, from cognate with French chalant, like nonchalant, uh, meaning warm. You might hear chont from, from Duolingo, um, which is great. It's this, like, what was historically looked down on as an accent because it was in standard Yiddish, Unterland Yiddish, in, in Unterland Yiddish, it's Interland Yiddish. And it's something that, like, that now is becoming the default accent when it was looked down on, uh, you know, by, by those who are, are you know, claiming to, to, to create a standard. And the standard is still being taught as like the, the grammatical standard, even though that's not necessarily what you might hear in conversation with everyday people. So it's this really interesting world. Um, so I, you know, I, I started this with saying, is there a revival going on? And it's sort of, but also it's like trying to revive something that's already alive. You know, you're doing CPR on a guy who's fine. Um, not fine, fine, but like he's alive, right? He's doing, he's okay, he's breathing. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. And I, I think for anybody who's interested in, in studying Yiddish, um, I don't think, like, I don't think you have to be Jewish to study Yiddish. Um, I don't think you have to, you know, be Hasidish to speak Yiddish. Um, you should recognize, you know, as you're talking with people, what communities they're a part of and respect their community norms and so on. But I would say, you know, do what makes you happy. I like the Interland accent. Um, it, it brings me joy. I also know people who are, you know, native speakers of Yiddish, and that's how they speak, and that's who I mostly would want to speak with. Uh, but at the same time, like, if you want to learn standard Yiddish, you want to learn college Yiddish, which I have on the shelf, it's Uriel Weinreich, then by all means, like, go for it. Learn that pronunciation. Speak with your, your friends at, you know, Yivo or Workman Circle and enjoy the process of, of learning Yiddish. I think the, the thing is, like, the the Haredim should you know would probably be best to to not say that you know those other people aren't really speaking Yiddish because they aren't speaking what you speak at home, and you know the people who are studying in Workman Circle and Yivo and learning it as a second language because it's what their you know grandparents or great grandparents may have spoken, possibly not with that accent or with those words. You know, same thing. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the language. Speak it with your friends. Speak it with people you don't know, and and also. Um, you know, just don't claim that it's dead and that you're reviving it single-handedly. So I have a couple, uh, couple more things I want to address, and then I'll, I'll just, uh, 
uh, wrap up because, like I said, the sun is setting quickly. Um, so I see uh, learners are likely not in grouped communities and are likely ostracized for the lack of cultural and linguistic heritage given assimilation and the refusal of elders to pass it on the U.S. That is a very real challenge, but I've also found that people are a lot more welcoming than they're given credit for being. Um, we tend to think those people over there are you know, not going to be very welcoming of me. Some of them aren't. But some of them are, and so it's worth you know uh, um, uh, seeing how things go. I will say I've had very uncomfortable experiences in Brooklyn trying to speak Yiddish with people who uh, did not want to talk to me. Um, I've also had wonderful conversations with native speakers from the same community. So it's it's you know we we should not stereotype uh, members of of other groups even when it's the same sort of subgroup as us. Um, I see there's a difference between wanting to learn to form a connection to a heritage uh, we've been cut off from and wanting to learn to someone with no connection just because it's neat, and I agree with that. Um, the heritage thing is really difficult because there are accents, there are word choices, there are, there are entire communities, there's entire minhugs, there's songs and things that are just erased. And so what you have is a choice between you know, a community that maybe isn't the same community as um, you know, your, your people are from, but that speaks Yiddish, or kind of building something new. And I think it's worth, like maybe it's worth building something new, but uh, you're very, very correct in that. And I've seen a lot of people who are just interested in it because it's just something different. I haven't really fully understood the draw for, for Yiddish for people who don't have a connection to Yiddishkeit. But you know what? I think uh, it's, it's so much the better for people to um, have a, a connection and a positive feeling and, and you know, get sort of a Hamish feeling from Yiddish and, and have a, a, you know, warm, fuzzy feelings for, for, for people who have historically been very oppressed. Um, I think it's, it's good. I see in the chat, are they called accents or dialects? There are different accents and there are different dialects, um, which would be both accent and grammar. So you, the, the syntactic patterns, the word choice, all of that goes into it. If you have a different accent, different word choices, and different grammar, we're going to say that's a different dialect. Um, Weinreich was famous, by the way, for saying uh, a quote, which is, uh, uh, what is it? a sprach is a dialect with army and flot, which is a a language is a dialect that has an army and a navy, which is basically saying it's just political power that makes something a language and not a dialect. And historically, that's that's been pretty accurate in linguistics. Um, I see what will be the topic of the next stream, and I have no idea. Uh, it'll come to me, but I'll I'll do one soon. Um, and I think I saw somebody asking about. Um, live streaming studying, which I might, I might do that. I, I would love to see you learn Farsi on stream. That, that could be fun. Um, I was thinking about live streaming studying, uh, thinking about Spanish in the, in the future. I know a lot of people are very interested in it. Um, and Farsi, I do, I do like, we can, we can approach that. I think actually, here you go, topic of the next stream, for those of you who are still around, topic of the next stream is going to be, I mentioned, analyze the paradigms of a language. I will actually walk you through doing that. Um, we could take, I don't know, French, we could take Italian, um, I'll do Hebrew because just maybe all verbs and not a whole paradigm, just to see how this stuff works and how analyzing it is actually going to be really uh, effective. And I see in the chat, why is the Yiddish flag bad? Because I did say I was going to say that. I don't like having flags for languages. Usually it's because it's a nation state. So if you go on Duolingo, you're going to see the, the flag of the People's Republic of China for Chinese, but that's not all the people who speak Chinese. And in fact, Yiddish has never had a nation state. Yiddish has been people who are barred from, being, from citizenship in the countries that they live in until the emancipation. And so to say, here's a flag for Yiddish land is just diametrically opposite the experience of Gullus, the experience of, 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 of diaspora, of um, exile, that is you know, core to the experience of Yiddish as it existed for most of the thousand years of its history. So I put the flag on my thing because you know, there's a couple of Yiddish flags, and I know people like flags for languages. I am staunchly opposed to flags, especially the flags of nation states for languages. Um, but I do understand that vexillology is fun and people like designs for, uh, for languages. So um, you know, there's a balance there. Um, uh, and I see in the chat the desire for connection. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you there. So um, uh, I had fun. Uh, I'm going to wrap up now because I got to go get some wine, uh, make sure we got all the candles signed, like, lined up. And, and you know, it, it's like I said, sunset is, I think, four. For anybody who's watching this, candle lighting is 410 in New York. So <laughs> go get ready. Um, and 
yeah, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one. I'll probably schedule it for sometime next week. And like I said, maybe uh, the, the topic will be how to analyze the paradigms in your language so that you can actually uh, streamline your studying process for whatever you're learning and not be overwhelmed by a lot of the gram grammatical rules. Because I do say, like, learn the grammar, but then you go and try and do it, and these books are not a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, uh, enjoy. For those of you, you know, who, who observe, have a good Shabbos and Chag Sameach. For those of you who, who don't or who have a different background, have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful uh, weekend and a wonderful rest of your week. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Ashena uh, Dank. And, and uh, you know, Saigazent, all, all of you. <laughs>